Section 1 of The Brilliant Proof by Mirza Abul Fazl Golpaigani. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. The Brilliant Proof. Borhaun Ilaume in reply to an attack upon the bahai revelation by peter z easton written december twenty eighth nineteen eleven in syria by the pen of mirza abul fazl golpaigani he is the living the self-subsistent in these days which are the latter days of 1911 A.D. and the early days of 1330 A.H., I have seen a curious article which astonished me. What did I see? I find that one of the missionaries of the Protestant sect, who accounts himself among the learned men of the 20th century, a helper of the pure religion of Christ, and one of the civilized and cultured occidentals by name peter z easton has been so provoked by jealousy at the universal spread of the heavenly word of his holiness abdul baha throughout the vast expanses of europe that he has trespassed the limit of courtesy and humanity and published an article replete with execration and calumny in the magazine evangelical christendom yea jealousy has caused many to fall from the high station and lofty summit of courtesy and thrown them headlong into the low depths of vain words and the writing of falsehood and slander but the fire of jealousy has flamed in this person with even greater violence for he has seen how that glorious man archdeacon wilberforce as befitting the station of men of learning and of eminence has spoken of abdul baha as master before a great assemblage and introduced him with terms of glorification and commendation to a mighty gathering having considered the entire contents of the above article i found the writer's sole aim to be an attempt to allay the fire of his jealousy by the mention of evil words and execration to count himself as victorious by wielding the arms of calumny and falsehood which are usually the only sword and sole weapon in the hands of a weak and ignorant opponent the realization of this caused even greater regret and remorse for i had never supposed that such traits and objectionable qualities could be manifested by souls who pretended to civilization and moral culture are there not enough revilers calumniators and prevaricators in the other parts of the world that such should also appear from europe should one accounting himself a teacher of good morals and a spreader of the superior virtues of christianity characterize himself with a quality which is the most specific sign and attribute of antichrist no by the life of god manifestors of such evil qualities do exist in the world even as dawning places of glorious qualities are also visible and manifest in order that the blessed words of the christ ye shall know the tree by its fruit may be fulfilled and that those who are akin to his holiness christ upon whom be glory may be distinguished from those who are contrary to him his holiness abdul baha calls the people of europe 
to the lofty attributes of humanity but peter z easton teaches them libels execration falsehood and calumnies his holiness abdul baha summons the dwellers in the world to unity and harmony but peter z easton invites men to division and inharmony his holiness abdul baha lifts his blessed hands heavenward in the assemblage of prayer and invokes blessing and mercy for the people of europe from the court of the almighty but peter z easton attempts to prove in learned magazines the remoteness of the people of the east from praiseworthy christian qualities and desires that torment and punishment should fall upon them abdul baha commands speak evil of no one and wish evil for no one but peter z easton says that no one should wish well for or consider as worthy of grace a people whose number he himself estimates as three millions i wonder therefore how we are to distinguish the good and evil fruits of the tree of existence and how shall we comprehend and interpret the blessed words ye shall know the tree by its fruits to my mind there is no criterion but this and peter z easton cannot teach otherwise consider the thirty-fourth verse of the twelfth chapter of the gospel of saint matthew where his holiness the christ says o ye generation of vipers how can ye being evil speak good things yea if it were possible for the sugar-cane to yield a bitter fruit and for the fragrant rose to exhale a foul odour such signs as these ye shall know the tree by its fruits would never have been revealed in the heavenly books and such distinction would never have been appointed as the correct criterion consequently that which emanates from his holiness abdul baha consists in calling men to the principles of faithfulness and accord and exhorting them to good morals and lofty attributes while that which appears from peter z easton consists of varying degrees of falsehood calumny libels execration and the like the purpose of all this is that the nature of each of the two persons may become manifest that the fruits of the tree of existence may be distinguished and men may find the true standard briefly as this servant carefully perused and weighed the above-mentioned article it was found that peter z easton in his own supposition has clung to four proofs in opposing the great bahai cause we will therefore mention these four points and clearly show the falsity of his fanciful ideas in each instance first words of writers who in his opinion have made accusations against baha'u'llah attributing objectionable qualities to him second the declaration that the teachings of baha'u'llah are pantheistic and that pantheism is a false doctrine third the statement that the intention of the bahai religion is to re-establish despotic government while despotism is the practice of tyrannical and forsaken governments fourth that the bahai religion is not able to show anything better or superior to other religions in a word 
what new things has baha'u'llah brought which are not found in the christian religion and what is the need of distinction now therefore it is necessary for us to write an answer to the assertions made under the forementioned points so that we may distinguish truth from falsehood and guidance from error end of section one section two of the brilliant proof by Mirza Abul Fazl Golpaigoni. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section two. As to the first point, which is the testimony of narrators, this missionary Peter Z. Easton has relied upon the statements of certain persons who have written against the most holy beauty of Abha in criticism and arrangement he says quote, why did not that esteemed man wilberforce heed and pay attention to the accounts of the christian missionaries who have lived in persia and the vicinity of Acre, all of whom have written against baha'u'llah this is a summary of the proof advanced by that reverend missionary but in the estimation of the people of knowledge such proof is exceedingly weak and base in the first place the writer of this article is truly and verily astounded that a man such as peter z easton who considers himself among the scholars of the twentieth century and accounts himself a judge competent to differentiate truth from falsehood that a man of his caliber should rely upon the testimony of one side only he should weigh the statements of at least twenty persons affirmative and negative friendly and hostile good and evil then ponder upon the sayings of the two sides with justice in order that he may arrive at a truthful conclusion as to the question and a judge with fairness and equity for just as some have written unfavourably regarding the most holy beauty of abha other people of insight and perception both eastern and western historians have recorded the utmost praise and eulogy in their books concerning the most holy beauty of abha according to what rule should conclusions be reached is man to be content with the judgment of the enemy alone and to consider as valid all that the opponent has written is it not true that every one who has committed this mistake has done so by listening to the statements of one side and paying no attention to the testimony of others furthermore have not the people of europe read history have they not heard the famous aphorism history repeats itself did not the great roman philosopher and historian tacitus at the beginning of the christian era and the commencement of the spread of christianity write in the most unmistakable terms that quote, the christian religion is the enemy of humanity end quote. in another place he wrote quote, the christian religion is among the destructive superstitions End quote. Suetonius, who was another of the philosophers and a Roman historian, pronounced the pure Christian religion quote, dishonesty, its acceptance contrary to truthfulness and high mindedness, and inimical to loyalty and good citizenship. End quote. Refer to the histories of the church 
in order that these statements may be confirmed with your own eyes and that you may bear witness to the ignorance of peter z easton regarding historical facts at present although travelling the writer has with him four histories of the church representing protestantism catholicism and greek orthodoxy among the books written by the greek roman and alexandrian philosophers against the christian religion nay rather against the very person of his holiness christ upon him be glory is that of celsus one of the famous philosophers of the second christian century he compiled a large book replete with terrible libels and calumny against the pure and holy person of christ porphyry the syrian who was among the greatest of platonic philosophers wrote a large book against christianity recording therein accusations and abusive attack against his holiness christ and his disciples this book was burned and destroyed by the order of two christian emperors sidotius and dolevantianus the historians of the church state that he was an eminent philosopher and an accomplished author ferento the eloquent master of rhetoric a tutor of king antonius wrote fifteen volumes against the christian religion and the quote, ignoble manners end quote, of the christians he antonius himself was one of the great emperors noted for erudition and philosophy european scholars speak of him as quote, the caesar of sublime wisdom end quote, and have written lofty chapters detailing his virtues james murdoch the american in his translation of the history of the church says with regard to the great university which was founded by ammonius saccas at alexandria and which is in need of no introduction or praise on account of its fame quote, from this university graduated two erudite scholars of eminence one was the emperor mark antony and the other was epictetus end quote. in short this great and wise emperor whose praises you have heard spoke of the christian people in terms of quote, inimical pretenders end quote, quote, imperfect minds end quote, quote, bereft of virtues and praiseworthy qualities end quote. this emperor considered it an important duty to be hostile to christians and exert himself in destroying them he says quote, you should ask concerning jesus of nazareth from his own people the jews and not from these poor romans none of whom have seen him but whom baseness and indolence have caused to follow him End quote. emperor julian who was likewise an eminent philosopher but whom the christians designate julian the apostate has written many books denouncing christianity and criticizing the manners of the christian community he called them enemies of the world of humanity but what the jews have written concerning his holiness jesus christ is beyond the power of the pen to portray one point however is sufficient for the man of intelligence and sagacity namely that nineteen hundred years have passed since the manifestation of christ and yet none of the jews expresses a wish to investigate his religion this well shows what the jewish learned men have written concerning his holiness 
and what evil qualities they have attributed to him taking the above facts into consideration we ask the astonishing writer peter z easton whether it is worthy of any unprejudiced man of sense to judge the character and qualities of baha'u'llah by relying upon those who have written against him if so how can one be expected to disregard what the above-mentioned hostile philosophers and eminent writers have stated concerning christ and trust in the text of the gospels written by his disciples rather than the testimony of learned men engaged in investigating the qualities and characters of his holiness is this not very astonishing but the writer of this article states that neither in these days nor in the days of christ should an intelligent man judge of a person by trusting in what his enemies say of him nay one should look at the deeds actions and traces of that person and reflect upon that which has emanated from him thus recognizing as the right criterion christ's own saying ye shall know the tree by its fruit for it is self-evident and proven thousands of times that every great personage finds many enemies who are jealous of him and when an enemy feels himself impotent he clings to slander and calumny and engages in libels and execration hence it is said by wise men evil speech is the weapon of the weak james murdoch of america in his translation of church history writes that quote, although roman rulers were mostly temperate and liberal towards their subjects in religious freedom yet for two reasons they interfered with the christians and endeavoured to extinguish and eradicate them first because of love for their own religion wherefore they would not allow the christians to interfere therewith and cause a weakening and degrading thereof second because the opponents of christianity accused its followers of vile calumnies before the rulers and characterized them with all kinds of vice and defects such as lack of piety abandonment of prayer and worship desire for dominion and power and a wish for leadership and changing of the government they accused the christians of immoral deeds and even of cannibalism asserting that the christians would kidnap the children of the romans kill them and prepare their flesh for consumption at banquets and entertainments End quote. this is a brief account of the calumnies which the above author has related so that men may thereby differentiate truth from falsehood were one to ponder over these facts he would testify that dependence upon such falsehoods and calumnies has always been the excuse of the enemies of god whereas such methods have never been conducive to attaining the knowledge of god and separating truth from falsehood for instance how can a man of perception trust in the words of baha'u'llah's enemies who have written that he god forbid intended to poison his brother were such sayings to be considered a criterion the truth of no one could be proven for all among the prophets have been the subject of similar reviling and accusations moreover jealousy and enmity entertained by mirza yahya the azal for baha'u'llah dates back to the time of their residence in baghdad
when in that city yahya witnessed the shining traces tablets of the sacred being whereby he assisted the cause of god caused the penetration of the word of god affected the gathering and union of the beloved and resisted the schemes and deceitful activities of the enemy azal himself fearing for his life which tendency is the most specific quality of the people of falsehood did not dare to appear nor to associate with people then the fire of jealousy and hatred which is so aflame to-day in the heart of mr easton became a blaze in his heart and he repeatedly planned to murder baha'u'llah again he sought to poison baha'u'llah in adrianople and according to trustworthy authorities attempted to do so twice but failing to accomplish his design availed himself of a new scheme and cried out that others had sought to poison him and take his life it is an evident point that a weak and defeated enemy always stoops to such pretexts and seeks to resist his opponents through secret means and subtle designs on the contrary the victorious and powerful party has no need of employing such means for if baha'u'llah had sought to destroy azal he was not impotent and needed no such method for the execution of his plan numerous historical and tangible evidences can be furnished to demonstrate and prove that it was even the powerful and mighty pen of baha'u'llah which protected from death his own enemies such as subh azal nasreddin shah and certain great doctors and divines otherwise the babis would not have allowed a single one of these people to have escaped alive yea it was baha'u'llah who through the effect of pure heavenly utterances even more refreshing than the zephyrs of the morn wafting from the rose garden and even more limpid than the vernal rain which distills drop by drop from the fragrant rose petals trained his friends so that the people of the world were amazed and astonished for these possessors of hearts and souls three hundred and thirteen of whom resisted in battle thousands of the regular troops of the government during many months astonishing and bewildering the enemy as well as the warriors of other nations by their valour heroism strength of heart firmness and resolution in the terrible battles of neiriz zanjan and mazandaran were so trained in tenderness of heart and gentleness of disposition through the glorious teachings of baha'u'llah that during the long years from the time of his arrival in baghdad down to the present day they have shown forbearance and self-restraint throughout many great events and have not committed that which would disturb any soul or be contrary to the law of any government they were killed but they killed no one they endured violent calamities but their lips were not opened in complaint when the late Haji muhammad reza of esfahan suffered martyrdom in the city of eshkabad in eighteen eighty two a d the chief of police found the city in great excitement and the baha'is exposed to danger he therefore permitted the baha'is to carry arms but they did not do so considering death better than self-defence the government then engaged in the trial of those who conspired and murdered the martyrs after five months trial examining and hearing both sides 
a high justice of the war department accompanied by an imposing body arrived at eshkabad from st petersburg an open court the account of whose proceedings would lead to prolixity was held that court ordered two of the murderers to be hanged and the conspirators to be imprisoned for life in siberia and subjected to hard labor as the governor of the province had the right to lessen this penalty in three days four of the baha'is appeared before him this great man was kamarov the victor of merv and the viceroy of the province they interceded for the condemned murderers as the governor was greatly pleased with the excellent conduct and good training of the baha'is he accepted their intercession and exercised his authority by changing the verdict of hanging into exile and reducing the punishment of the others from hard labor to simple confinement these incidents referred to are not based upon hearsay but are recorded in the register of the government of eshkabad and in other official papers now could such a pure morality kindness and gentleness such training and noble conduct be inculcated by one who had attempted murder and who sought to poison his own brother what then becomes of the words of his holiness christ ye shall know them by their fruit and what becomes of the criterion embodied in the words thou makest righteous by thy words and thou judgest by thy sayings should hatred for the people of baha cause one to deny all reliable criteria and rules of judgment it is for ye to judge end of section two section three of the brilliant proof by mirza abul fazle gulpaigani this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by nicholas james bridgewater section three as to the second point which is peter z easton's statement that the creed of the baha'is is pantheism this likewise is a manifest calumny and a false accusation displaying his ignorance of the subject of pantheism for the teachings of baha'u'llah in no manner resemble pantheism pantheism is a philosophical question and to treat it is the work of scholars and learned men it has nothing to do with the function of revelation or the station of the founders of religions the writer of this article believes that the teachings of pantheism have originated from the platonic school of philosophy which is founded upon devotion seclusion rigid discipline and shunning bodily enjoyments the same philosophy is the source of celibacy in christianity and sufism in mohammedanism it was transferred from the brahmans of india to the philosophers of athens and to the platonists of alexandria who became known as the neoplatonists this late platonic school held that the reality of the spirit which is an active essence effective throughout the world is but one indivisible reality this indivisible reality simple essence and ancient identity comprehends all things and the souls of all animate organisms are but rays descending from that ancient reality these platonists in their own belief gathered from this principle 
the theory that each human soul is a ray from the universal divine reality and a drop from the sea of the ancient holy essence which is confined in the prison of the body and has thus been separated from that universal simple reality of realities thus they taught that a seeker of perfection must devote himself to severe discipline such as vigils successive prayers fasting abstaining from physical luxuries and denial of material bounties in order that he may release his soul from the bodily prison cause it to unite itself with the ancient reality of realities and reach the apex of eternal bliss referring to this theory eben mescovie cites in his work tehorat ul akhlaq purification of morals a quotation from the divine plato to wit quote, die by thy will and you shall live by nature End quote. this is a brief account of the subject of pantheism its source and origin if the people of investigation look with keen eyes upon the creation and formation of nations they would find the atoms of this strange doctrine scattered in the horizons of the western regions they would also trace pantheism to the thoughts of greek philosophers references thereto have come down to us through treatises and essays of scholars and descriptions thereof are to be found in various books and writings were it not for the desire to avoid prolixity we would draw examples from those writings in order that the real truth might be known to men of insight and the source and origin of pantheism as well as peter z easton's ignorance of it become clear and manifest his holiness abdul baha in the book some answered questions has clearly shown the plane of those who believe in pantheism for he has mentioned the followers of pantheism as opposed to the prophets and messengers and has removed all causes for such superstitious beliefs reference to page 327 of that book will thoroughly expose the shallowness of such false accusations as to the third point this refers to peter z easton's statement that the outcome of the bahai religion is a return of despotic rule overlooking the falsehood and sheer calumny of this statement it is a proof of his lack of information regarding the laws and ordinances of the bahai faith he is likewise ignorant of what has been explicitly revealed in the book of laws kitab ul aqdas concerning the organization of a house of justice in every city of the world the members of which according to the conditions stated in the book shall be elected by the people such members must hold their consultations in the utmost purity of conscience and good will moreover in the glad tidings which is one of the well-known tablets of this most great manifestation the substance of the last paragraph is as follows quote, although a republican form of government profits all the people of the world yet the majesty of kingship is one of the signs of god if a statesman combine the two into one form their reward will be great before god End quote. that is to say hereditary sovereignty should be limited by a national parliament and representative assembly in this way national problems and questions of citizenship will find solution through the cooperation of these two bodies so that the country and nation may attain perfection 
and people arrive at the highest pitch of welfare and prosperity inasmuch as the original tablet is not at hand the substance thereof is mentioned if a reference be made to the tablet of the glad tidings which should be considered from all standpoints as to the beauty of expression in the heavenly utterances surely the reader will exclaim blessed be god the most excellent of creators in one of the long tablets which is considered accessory to the kitab al aqdas he has illustrated the form of constitutional government and representative assembly by the british government the form of that great government has therefore met with his approval and sanction consequently the fear that despotism will be restored is caused by ignorance concerning the commandments of this most great manifestation and the outcome of reliance upon the sayings of enemies regarding international discussions as to the fourth and greatest point he says quote, what new command is there in the bahai religion which is lacking in christianity End quote. although this question is an abstruse one which cannot be fully comprehended by a person unless he be well versed in the books of the two peoples yet we will expound it clearly in such a way as to be easily understood by every soul and we will explain the specific features of this great movement and prove the necessity of this most holy manifestation for the comfort and upbuilding of the world thus may disinterested persons attain insight and every just one arise in thanksgiving for this great bestowal of god the all-glorious it is evident to every perceiving soul that the world of humanity will attain perfection and that happiness and welfare the desire of nations and goal of all hearts will be ensured when religious differences and sectarianism the cause of alienation and estrangement of the people are utterly removed from the world and all estrangements and schisms such as racial patriotic and political divisions etc are dispelled from among men thus may men become as brothers loving and kind toward each other these terrible wars which are the greatest catastrophes of humanity and civilization will disappear the vast sums the expenditure of which is undoubtedly the cause of impoverishing men and destroying the world will no longer be devoted to destructive pursuits and infernal machinery this question is so clear and lucid that the most deficient mind can pass judgment upon it nevertheless this condition has been confirmed by the divine glad tidings and established by heavenly prophecies for the holy books contain explicit record that in the great day which has been exalted by various names such as the last day the time of the end the latter day the day of the lord etc the glorious lord will descend and will unite all nations in the worship of the one god he will so train all men in lofty and spiritual qualities that warfare and conflict will be uprooted rancor and hatred will be replaced by sociability and peace and implements of war be changed into farming and trading tools this is a brief statement of the promises of the prophets concerning the latter day it is self-evident that all nations are awaiting and anticipating the advent of such a day and the coming 
of such a great cause nay they pray and supplicate god to hasten its arrival but the greatest obstacles among the nations are the signs and conditions which shall appear with the praiseworthy manifestation and promised day for all the manifestations of god and founders of religion who have formerly come have mentioned the signs of this great event in their respective books and emphasized and clearly recorded them in their utterances but every prophet who appeared recorded the self-same signs mentioned by his predecessor and repeated the same words yet without undertaking to explain the meaning of those signs and conditions or make his object therein known for instance consider how for a thousand years his holiness moses and the israelitish prophets spoke and uttered glad tidings to the people of the coming of the lord of hosts who would harmonize and unite all in the worship of one god among the signs of the day of his coming announced by them are first the rolling up of the heavens second the sun will be darkened third the moon shall not give her light fourth the stars shall fall from heaven fifth the dead shall arise from their tombs sixth ferocious animals will make peace with grazing animals seventh they will share the same pasture and food eighth the children will play with poisonous serpents ninth the people of israel who in that day shall have become scattered and humiliated throughout all the nations of the east and west will be again assembled together by the lord of hosts who will establish them in their promised land and confer upon them eternal glory and everlasting dominion these are in short some of the prophecies which all the israelitish prophets announced to their people and recorded in their books they did not state however that these promises were to be taken in a literal sense without symbolism and interpretation or that the symbolic texts were subject to commentary fifteen hundred years subsequent to the time of his holiness moses the very same promises and signs were revealed by his holiness christ upon whom be glory consider verses twenty nine to thirty one of the twenty fourth chapter of st matthew and the tenth and eleventh verses of the third chapter of the second epistle of peter the apostle so that you may witness the mention of these promises and signs with the utmost clearness likewise his holiness christ and his disciples confined themselves to the mere mentioning of these signs as was done by the israelitish prophets not undertaking to explain their meaning consequently the christian doctors disagreed in their interpretation of those holy books some said that those promises were literal statements and not subject to interpretation and must therefore be fulfilled outwardly others among the commentators stated that those promises were symbolic and that they were words requiring interpretation in order that their real meaning might thereby become evident that is that the seal of the book might be opened in the latter day six hundred years after his holiness christ the seal of the prophets announced his mission and the very same promises were again revealed in the koran the same conditions and signs were identically repeated but again the koran made no reference to the meaning intended by those prophecies nor did it state 
whether they were symbolic or subject to interpretation consequently were a man to consider what has been stated he would most clearly find that the greatest obstacles against the unification of nations have been these very prophecies glad tidings conditions and signs for the various peoples have been prevented from uniting with each other because the meanings intended by those prophecies were not clear end of section three Section 4 of The Brilliant Proof by Mirza Abul Fazle Golpaigani. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Section 4. Although citing an illustration leads to prolixity, yet we will do so for the purpose of enlightening and further elucidating the matter to the reader for example let us assume that a christian missionary should say to a jew quote, dear friend why are you sleeping and heedless the promised messiah whose coming was foretold by all the prophets has appeared End quote. then imagine the jew answering quote, how splendid how splendid what beautiful glad tidings and joyous news we jews have made all our wishes dependent upon the coming of the messiah and daily supplicate by prayer for his advent now let us see this promised messiah whom you declare to have appeared End quote. the christian missionary answers quote, the promised messiah was that wronged youth jesus of nazareth who sacrificed his life for the liberation and salvation of the world End quote. the jew would reply o oh, esteemed teacher clear signs are recorded in the holy books regarding the appearance of the messiah none of which came to pass we jews have not found our religion so easily that we can relinquish it carelessly you consider yourself a teacher of the holy books see then in the heavenly books the words that at the time of the coming of the promised messiah the sun will be darkened the moon will turn into blood the new heaven and the new earth will become manifest the stars will fall the dead will arise where and when did these prophecies become fulfilled during the day of the nazarene and who saw them furthermore let me show you numerous passages wherein it has been clearly revealed that when the promised messiah appears he will gather together all the jews scattered throughout the world and he will save them from the great humiliation execration and tyranny which they suffer then he will establish them in the holy land and confer upon them dominion and eternal glory now tell me when did jesus of nazareth accomplish such a thing nay through his manifestation the contrary came to pass for we were established in the holy land but we have become scattered through his coming we were esteemed we have become humiliated we were assembled we became dispersed we were blessed we became afflicted with curses all this was contrary to the promises given to the israelitish people so to accept jesus would be to deny those glorious prophets End quote. in brief at this point in the conversation the christian missionary would fail to answer the jew for he himself does not understand the real meanings of these glad tidings how then could he explain them to the jews and cause them to be convinced and assured 
therefore during this long period the missionaries of the christian religion have attempted to discomfit and confound the jews yet without traversing the pathway of true knowledge and real proof instead of bringing them near the gospels they cause them to be annoyed and further removed it is therefore recorded in church history that during this long period that is since the conversion of the great constantine down to our time both in the days of charlemagne and during the crusades they repeatedly attempted to force the jews to accept christianity but in the end they failed now had they known the meanings of these glad tidings there would be no need of using force and compulsion similar to this is the attitude of the muslim toward the christian when the muslim desires to prove the truth of the mission of the seal of the prophets to a christian he refers the christian to the signs recorded in the twenty-fourth chapter of saint matthew then that muslim not understanding the meanings thereof is forced to say that this gospel in the hands of the christians is not the original gospel which descended with jesus upon whom be peace as you readily see the muslim will clearly prove in word and writing that this gospel has been interpolated by the christian scholars and that it has been attributed to his holiness christ in this case the christian to whom the reality of the gospel is evident and manifest and the love of this holy book firmly established in his heart will be amazed at the incorrect answer of the muslim instead of fellowship and friendship with the muslim the christian becomes an enemy of the islamic religion and an opponent of the mohammedan people in short one of the great obstacles to the unity of the nations is this difficulty which has been explained by the foregoing illustration all these abstruse problems are involved and explained in the statement that because the christian missionaries do not understand the real meanings of the books of religions which have appeared prior to the manifestation of his holiness christ upon whom be peace therefore they cannot guide others to their own religion this has become evident and manifest as to the religions which have appeared before his holiness christ inasmuch as retrogression and reversal are opposed to natural motion and contrary to the progress and advancement which are evident and manifest in world movements therefore the christian cannot turn development backward and cause other people to descend the ladder of progress in order to unite them to themselves the great man lord curzon has partly understood this point when he writes quote, the conversion of asiatics to the christian religion is without effect and result End quote. now that this subject has been clearly elucidated we will submit that the present state of progress in the world necessitates the most great manifestation while his holiness baha'u'llah resided in baghdad the first book revealed by him was kitab -e i qan which is the key to unlock the seals of the heavenly books it comprehends the realities revealed in holy writ by it the doors of the understanding of prophetic words were opened to the faces of the people of baha the real meaning of the divine glad tidings were revealed and the original purposes of such terms as were latent and unknown became manifested these terms are death life heaven earth sun moon stars resurrection etc thus the means of unity became facilitated 
and the hindrances to international misunderstandings were removed the signs and emblems of accord and agreement among inimical and opposing people became manifest and apparent for you observe that while now is but the commencement of the bahai religion yet difficult questions and doctrines have become so clearly explained to and so easily accepted by various peoples that numerous souls among zoroastrians jews nusayrites and others who have never believed in his holiness christ nor would listen to a single verse of the gospel have now become acknowledged believers in baha'u'llah through the effect of his blessed utterances moreover they consider his holiness christ the promised lord and his heavenly book the divine holy word they associate and consort with christians in their feasts and gatherings with the utmost kindness and fellowship in the spirit of utmost friendship a question is propounded to this esteemed missionary peter z easton who without understanding in the least the significance of the kingdom of christ eulogizes it do these evident signs cause the kingdom of christ to be at hand or do anathema execration unseemly words and the writing of debasing articles in magazines wherein libel and calumny are attributed to pure and holy souls it is most astonishing we do not know what mr easton and his allies understand the kingdom of christ to be and to signify is the kingdom of christ for the ratification and execution of his words or to prove the opposite of the word of christ and promulgate the attributes of his enemies his holiness christ clearly states quote, bless them that curse you end quote whereas mr easton and his peers carry out the meaning of quote, curse them that bless you end quote. the soul who seeks benediction and mercy they characterize with most unseemly words and desire for him evil and perdition baha'u'llah proves to the unbelieving nations that his holiness christ was the son of god and the word of god whereas mr easton and his peers pronounce him the antichrist strange john the evangelist the beloved of christ in his first epistle says quote, he who doeth righteousness is righteous End quote. but these opponents say quote, he who doeth a righteous deed verily he is a murderer and an impostor End quote. likewise in this epistle he says quote, whosoever shall confess that jesus is the son of god god abideth in him and he is in god End quote. but they say that one who according to their own admission has convinced three million souls and made them believe that jesus was the son of god and the word of god is deprived of the knowledge of god and has no portion of the fragrance of god is it not always clearly shown and positively proven that in this day we should understand by the words ye shall know the tree by its fruit in the sermon on the mount that the purpose of his holiness christ was that we should not pay heed to false accusations or listen to that which the people of prejudice spread among men nay we should consider the deeds of every person the correct criterion and through this balance differentiate between truth and falsehood end of section four
Section 5 of The Brilliant Proof by Mirza Abul Fazle Golpaigani. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Section 5. In short, let us return to the original matter, which refers to Peter Z. Easton's question. Quote, what has baha'u'llah brought which is not found in the christian religion End quote. although the great function of the revelation of baha'u'llah in solving the intricacies of the heavenly books facilitating the removal of differences from among nations and establishing unity and harmony among the sections of the human world is sufficient proof of the greatness and thoroughness of the bahai religion nevertheless we will now consider the laws and ordinances of this religion explain their specific virtues their benefits and good results first a command which is particularly a feature of the Baha'i religion and is not found in the other religion is quote, abstaining from crediting verbal traditions. End quote. It is well known to men of learning that it was a verbal tradition which divided the Jews into two great sects such traditions are the basis of the book of talmud and cause the division of that one nation one of the two schisms called the rabbinim looks upon the teachings of the talmud as the law which needs to be followed and considers it the greatest means for the preservation and permanence of the israelitish people but the other sect, Garaim, looks upon the Talmud as sheer heresy and conducive to perdition. Thus these two sects cannot possibly be harmonized or cease mutual opposition. Similarly, in the Christian religion, the main cause of schism and division were these verbal traditions which were termed authoritative each one of the christian churches such as the catholic the orthodox the jacobite the nestorian and others consider it obligatory to follow these traditions inherited from and handed down by the fathers of the church as the very text of the holy book thus when in any of the great councils the question of the unification of the christian people would be at issue they would avail themselves of these inherited traditions which were opposed to union and harmony likewise in the religion of islam claiming these verbal traditions which were related of the founder of that religion subsequent to his death was the cause of the division and separation into various of the principal sects such as the sunnite the shiite and the kharajite or into the secondary schools of hanafite malachite shafiite hanbalite etc each of these hold to a set of traditions considered as authentic by their own sect but baha'u'llah closed to the people of the world this door which is the greatest means for sedition for he has clearly announced that quote, in the religion of god all recorded matters are referable to the book and all unrecorded matters are dependent upon the decision of the house of justice end quote. thus all narrations relations and verbal traditions have been discredited 
among the bahai people and the door of dissension which is the greatest among the doors of hell has been closed and locked second one of the laws and ordinances peculiar to the bahai religion is the law prohibiting the interpreting of the word of god for interpretation of the words and exposition of personal opinion has been one of the greatest means of dissension in the former religions the cause of darkening of the horizon of faith and concealing the real meaning of the book of god it is an evident fact that learned men differ in their minds and the natural gifts of sagacity and intelligence or the lack of understanding and comprehension vary in degrees among them thus when the door of interpretation and perverting of the words from their outward meaning is opened strange opinions and curious contradictory interpretations will result and different sects will arise among the one people and one religious community consequently baha'u'llah has explicitly commanded his followers to wholly abandon the door of interpretation and follow the words revealed in the tablets according to their outward meaning so that the events which have transpired among the past nations should not recur among the bahai people and the unwelcome happenings which appeared among the various sects due to the difference in mentality and viewpoint should not become manifest in this new auspicious day which is the day of the glorious lord thus one of the explicit commands of this great manifestation is the ordinance abrogating differences which separate men it is because one of the occasions of dissension is difference of scholars with regard to the station of the manifestation of the cause in former religions even as testified by history it has become evident that when in a question of this kind a difference has arisen between two of the doctors of religion both parties were firm in their standpoints and held tenaciously to their sides while the laity according to their usage would adhere some to one and some to the other thus closing the doors to agreement and unity to such an extent that religious fraternity was changed into deep and bitter enmity scientific dissension terminating in bloody strife and warfare this is illustrated by differences which arose between arius the priest and alexander the bishop of constantinople regarding the trinity in the fourth century a d also the nestorian differences which took place in the fifth century between nestorius the bishop of constantinople and the other bishops which caused terrible wars and the shedding of precious blood the effect of these sad dissensions has lasted until the present day there are clear proofs and evidences for the point at issue time does not allow us to make mention of the numerous sects and divisions of the gnostics and others of which the church historians have counted more than thirty and incorporated them under the term born of philosophy all seekers of full accounts are referred to authoritative books on the subject in order that they may clearly realize that all these divisions and sects 
came from the disagreements of the doctors as to the degree and station of his holiness christ and their persistence in their respective opinions the subject of disagreement by the doctors as to the station of the manifestation of god has been one of those abstruse and difficult questions to solve which proved beyond the power of great minds and baffled a mighty king like constantine the great for notwithstanding the assistance and cooperation of the great bishops of the east and west he could not reconcile the various parties to the arian controversy nay during this long time the power of local councils the sword of european powers and the verdicts of inquisitorial boards failed to remove divisions and schisms caused by metaphysical discussions but the removal of this indissoluble knot and incurable disease by the easiest of means has been announced in the holy bahai literature for baha'u'llah in one of his holy tablets has clearly revealed the following quote, since men differ in their degree of knowledge if two persons should be found to possess different viewpoints as regards the degree and station of the manifestation of god both are acceptable before god for in accord with the blessed verse verily we have created souls different in degrees god has created men different in understanding and diverse in manners but if those having two points of view engage in conflict and strife while expressing their views both of them are rejected for by knowing the manifestation of god it is intended to unify the hearts cultivate souls and to teach the truth of god whereas conflict and strife of two persons with two different points of view would do harm to the cause of god consequently both of them are referred to the fire End quote. this was the purport of the blessed tablet in brief accordingly in this holy cause no one has power to create in harmony and because of fear of falling no one dares to persist in his own opinion at the expense of harmony fourth among the specific laws clearly laid down in the cause of baha'u'llah is the law prohibiting slavery no mention of this is made in other religions as none of the former heavenly books has forbidden this traffic all the humanitarian instincts which actuated the great powers to abolish and destroy it could not withhold the common people from this abominable practice which has cost the government and nations great trouble and expense for instance the freeing of the slaves constitutes one of the important responsibilities of the egyptian government this necessitates a heavy drain upon the state treasury furthermore the trial and indictment of those guilty of this nefarious traffic brings great affliction and often ruin upon many noted families fifth among the laws peculiar to this great cause is the law making it quote, obligatory upon all to engage in allowable professions as a means of support and obedience to this law is accepted as an act of worship End quote. were a man of insight to consider this strong command he would testify to the great benefit it contributes 
towards regulating the affairs of civilization and removing impediments and calamities from human society for it is evident how in this present day innumerable souls designated as monks anchorites hermits religious devotees dignitaries and others although sound in body and limb abstain from occupation and trade passing their time in indolence and idleness and living upon the proceeds of other men's labor in reality such men as are atrophied limbs upon the body of humanity and a heavy burden to the men of industry and agriculture when by a law of religion these innumerable souls abandon idleness and indolence and engage in useful occupations one can well realize how much this will contribute to the commonwealth and remove the difficulties of the body politic sixth the law making the education of children of both sexes compulsory this law is also one of the commands explicitly revealed in this most great cause and concerning which no mention is made in any of the other religions for in the other religions the education of the masses is made dependent upon the law of the government if in former times a government would fail to issue a decree providing for compulsory education and this failure would result in the decadence of learning and knowledge the nation would take no thought of it nor would the people consider themselves and the government responsible for no law concerning this subject has been revealed in the heavenly books but when a law is laid down in the heavenly book of a nation every individual member will consider himself bound to execute it and no one will fail to heed that law for they will not be dependent upon the government to carry it out seventh the command prohibiting cursing and execration and making it obligatory upon all to abstain from uttering that which may offend men for as is evident in moral science cursing reviling and speaking in harsh words and offensive phrases is one of the greatest causes of alienating hearts filling minds with rancor creating hatred and animosity among the peoples and igniting the fire of calamitous warfare among men thus it is said by wise men verily war begins in words and the poet ferdosi has said quote, a mere word is the cause of warfare End quote. another verse illustrating this point at issue is quote, the wound inflicted by the tongue is deeper than that inflicted by the sword End quote. were one to ponder over the differences and schisms already spoken of which arose among the christian peoples creating different sects and schools such as the arians nestorians gnostics and others kindling the fire of terrible battlefields and violent calamities he would clearly find from the testimony of authentic history that the principal and initial cause of such divisions and disasters was the difference of opinion between two religious doctors which would result in discussion and controversy in order to overcome his opponent and demonstrate the correctness of his own view or because of believing his own opinion correct each would so persist in his attitude that it would finally lead to harshness towards the other 
this harshness would gradually lead to insinuating remarks and annoying statements which in time would culminate in reviling execrating fighting and even bloodshed now the harmful outcome of these religious fights and their evil effect upon human society needs no mentioning here for the calamities caused by these differences during the past ages are recorded in the historical books of every nation and the hardships which have continued down to our time as the painful result of those dissensions are evident to men of understanding end of section five section six of the brilliant proof by mirza abul fazle gulpaigani this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by nicholas james bridgewater section six perhaps someone may advance an objection saying that ordinances prohibiting anathema and execration are found in the other heavenly books as for instance the commands of his holiness christ well known as the sermon on the mount wherein he most lucidly states quote, whosoever calleth another a fool is in danger of hell-fire in the quran it is stated quote, curse not those who claim spiritual mission without the permission of god thus without knowledge cursing god as an enemy End quote. the answer to this objection is evident to the people of insight for such ordinances and prohibitions are considered as educational commands in the estimation of the learned and not as laws and enactments of religion consider this command of the sermon on the mount wherein he states quote, whosoever is angry with his brother falsely is subject to the law End quote. again he says quote, store not for yourselves treasures End quote. and again quote, be not concerned with the morrow End quote. also quote, whosoever smiteth thee on the right cheek turn to him the other also End quote. and quote, whosoever desireth thy garment give him also thy cloak End quote. then later on he says quote, whosoever asks of thee give unto him and whosoever would borrow of thee prevent him not End quote. it is fully evident that the learned men and doctors of the christian and mohammedan religions have not considered these ordinances as imperative men of intelligence versed in law and jurisprudence have not deemed those who disobeyed these laws deserving of punishment and trial nay as already mentioned they have unanimously accounted them educational laws moreover some of those laws are such that the doctors have not considered those slighting them as transgressors or evil-doers before god for instance quote, if any one smites you upon the one cheek turn to him the other he who begs of you give to him he who seeks to borrow from you do not refuse him End quote. the above statement will clearly show why such commands and ordinances were not considered by the leaders of the christian peoples as imperative and obligatory and why they could not remove cursing and execration 
from among the community but in the bahai religion the commands prohibiting cursing reviling swearing and blasphemy have been revealed as imperative and obligatory laws the responsibility attaching to the violators has been revealed in various tablets emphatic commands have been issued in regard to the purity of pen and tongue prohibiting the writing or speaking of that which will offend men for example although in various tablets such as the ishraqat and others the law prohibiting cursing and execration has been explicitly laid down nevertheless baha'u'llah during his latter days in the blessed book of the covenant fortified and emphasized the following command to the people of the world Quote, o ye people of the world i exhort ye towards that which is the cause of the elevation of your station hold fast to the fear of god and adhere to the hem of kindliness verily i say unto you the tongue is for the mention of good defile it not with unseemly words verily god has forgiven the past hereafter all must utter that which is seemly shun anathema execration and that whereby man is perturbed the station of man is great some time ago this lofty word was revealed from the treasury of the pen of abha today is a great blessed day that which was latent in man is today revealed and become manifest the station of man is great should he adhere to veracity and truth and remain firm and steadfast in the cause End quote every intelligent soul who reflects upon this utterance quote, verily god has forgiven the past hereafter all must utter that which is seemly shun anathema execration and that whereby man is perturbed End quote. will clearly see how emphatic an ordinance has been given forth ratifying the prohibition of anathema and execration because according to the law current among the people of knowledge the purport of this blessed utterance is an explicit prohibition concerning anathema and execration the intended purpose thereof is the unpardonable position of the one who violates this mighty command and decisive blessed ordinance in this case to the people of insight it is evident manifest and firmly established that the prohibition as regards anathema and execration is an especialized ordinance and one of the particular commandments of this greatest dispensation thus through the favor of god the most high from the traces of the supreme pen this unseemly action and the ordeals resulting therefrom may disappear from among the people of the world and the glad tidings recorded in the third verse of the twenty-second chapter of the revelation of saint john concerning the events of the day of manifestation namely quote, hereafter there shall be no more cursing end quote, shall be realized eighth 
relative to the carrying of arms except in time of necessity this ordinance is not to be found in other religions but in the bahai religion it is considered as one of the imperative and essential commands the great utility of this law is most evident and manifest how many souls who are not able to control excessive anger have given vent to it by the use of arms ready at hand if the murderer had not been armed often after one hour the violence of his anger would have subsided and no crime would have resulted these are the minor evil results of carrying arms there are other greater evils continually manifested by people who carry arms which are productive of great revolutions and excessive losses for the government and nations the details of this are not in keeping with brevity and are conducive to prolongation nevertheless the afflictions of the nations and ordeals of the people are evident to men of perception ninth the question relative to the necessity of the creation of the house of justice and institution of the national assemblies and constitutional governments this command is likewise specialized to this evident religion and is not mentioned in the others for under other religions it is possible for despotic governments to be restored and founded because the love of the permanence establishment and endurance of religious ordinances and the fear of going contrary to them is so deeply rooted in human souls by reason of the fear of god that they would not pass away in a thousand years and would not be superseded except through the renewal of the religion and the reform of laws in short these are some of the especial commands of the bahai religion which the writer of these lines has submitted in accordance with this opportune occasion the consideration of brevity has made it necessary to omit the mentioning of other special commandments in this most great dispensation among them are ethics and conditions requisite for a wife's knowledge of her travelling or absent husband another concerns the prohibition of haughtiness and egoism another is a command as to purity of all things with recommendation and encouragement to observe sanitary measures and cleanliness and to shun utterly all that tends to filth and uncleanness among them is a command directing the agreement of nations in the abolition of warfare and battles and the conservation of the conditions of security and peace many such commands exist the words of amplification and detail of which are beyond the limits of this occasion for justice to this most important subject would necessitate the compilation of a large volume and not a short article but although the article may assume more lengthy proportion i am forced nevertheless to remind the people of knowledge of one distinguishing feature of the many in the bahai religion perchance the radiant sight may attain to the great bestowal of this most supreme cause and the pure tongue may utter thanksgiving and praise to god the blessed the sublime it is this one of the abstruse problems of social philosophy is the prevention of monopoly and wealth control 
by certain individuals. This subject has been discussed by the philosophers of the world for many years. The wise men of Europe and America, especially the socialists, in endeavouring to solve this abstruse problem, have entered into minute discussion and deep analyses. The governments of Europe and America have given the subject exhaustive attention. Nevertheless, they have not yet agreed upon any opinion, and have not reached a consensus of remedy for the solution of this seemingly insurmountable question. But if a soul should ponder and reflect upon the divine institution concerning the question of heritage and the modus operandi of the distribution of legacies among heirs, according to the laws of this dispensation, he will see that this all-important problem has been solved in the simplest manner. The distribution of wealth among the nations has been established according to the best method. Inasmuch as the matter of death among mankind is an unavoidable event, if the distribution of the estate left by those who are sent to God should be effected according to this divine recommendation, it will be impossible for wealth to be accumulated by the few, or for any particular family to exercise a monopoly, leaving others deprived and afflicted by poverty and want. For the mighty lawgiver has dealt with this important affair in this manner. He has divided the heirs of the deceased into seven classes, including teachers who are the spiritual fathers of enlightened individuals in the world of humanity. The heritage is divided according to the number 2520, which is the lowest number comprising the integral fractions of nine. Under this division, the seven classes eligible to legacies are as follows. First, offspring. Second, wives. Third, fathers. Fourth, mothers. Fifth, brothers. Sixth, sisters. Seventh, teachers the nearest relatives are arranged the closest each class receives its due according to the number sixty which runs down through all he has decreed that these seven classes mentioned will come equally into possession of their legitimate rights each receiving his share from this division when the people of insight reflect upon that which has been recorded, they will see that with this command in operation, wealth will never be monopolized by a limited few, and no individual, through sheer forceful skill, will come into possession of another's wealth. Wealth will always be in circulation among all. All mankind will inherit from one another, and all will be benefited from this capital. Yea, when a person reflects upon the distribution affected in the book of Bayan by the Bob, he will conclude that such a division mentioned therein may affect the interest of the offspring. But the manner in which it is provided for in the book of Agdas, through the supreme pen, wherein the heritage of the children is multiplied, dispels this fear. To all people of insight, it is evident that in this most great cause, all the means of comfort for the nation have been provided, and a plan of readjustment for the affairs of the people of the world from all standpoints has been established that which has been stated here 
will suffice to answer in brief the objections of mr easton and those like him now in regard to the question of features distinguishing this great cause from other laws and religions of the people of the world in all centuries and ages if fair-minded and intelligent men of knowledge should ponder and reflect upon the judicious laws of the lord of mankind they will no doubt bear witness to the perfection of divine providence in the laws thus instituted for instance these three firm and irrefutable ordinances namely first the question of heritage and the question of socialism solved second the question of universal peace and international agreements regarding the disarmament and conserving expenditure now devoted to implements of war third the question of all being commanded to acquire a profession art or trade whereby they may earn a living thus lightening the burden of expense to those upon whom it falls such as farmers laborers and others this expense is created by the idlers and unemployed members of the human family these fair-minded and intelligent men will also testify that the readjustment of the world and the salvation of mankind from great dangers is conditioned upon following the commands of this most great manifestation thus will they utter the blessed words blessed is god the possessor of the dominion and the kingdom now at this point we bring our words to an end and at the closing of this statement we beseech god the blessed the supreme to bestow upon mr easton and other deniers through his infinite mercy the light of insight and knowledge in order that they may glance at that which has been submitted in an impartial and disinterested spirit thus may they become informed of the reality of the divine cause and be guided to that which is the source of salvation life glory and prosperity and this is not difficult by the favour of god written december twenty eighth nineteen eleven in syria by the pen of mirza abul fazl Golpoigon. End of section six. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Recorded in London, England.